Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. Welcome to episode four of The Media Game. I'm your host, Amber Danes. In this episode, you will learn how to be PR and social media savvy. I'm a massive believer that the two platforms, both PR, world traditional media, as well as social media, interact beautifully to create a PR strategy which will make you persistent and consistent as you conquer the media game. So how do you craft a strategy that is consistent and persistent? Well, this does require a little bit of planning and preparation. So stepping back from perhaps preparing for a media interview, stepping back from where you'd like to position yourself and really doing an audit on your business and your brand to work out perhaps where the PR messaging is the strongest. I really think that everyone should have, like they do a business plan, a PR plan, a living document which allows them to add ideas to make sure that what they're doing is tracking with their business goals as well as the bigger picture of why they're even doing PR. Journalists all use social media. We live in an age where it is inevitable. So recent statistics show that globally, 50% of people will receive their news feeds via an online news service. So that could be through social media platforms like Twitter, could be Facebook, but it's also the interaction, the sharing of news articles from traditional news outlets. So making sure that you are social media savvy will make you the journalist's very best friend. TV news and media require content. There's no doubt about it, but they want to make sure it's the right content for their audience. All journalists use social media, so you're doing yourself a massive favour by becoming social media aware, but understand the tools and techniques which will get your ideas out there. You can also work quite closely with PR and social media interacting, so I'll discuss a little bit more how that happens as we move over to the whiteboard. So with TV and news media, there are only three reasons I'd ever want to be speaking to you. The first one is about raising awareness about your topic, your idea, your business, your brand. The second would be around reinforcing those key ideas or messages. So if you're a brand that's been around for a while and you've had some success, but you might have competitors who've come into the market, you'll want to remind people why you're the best or you're the most innovative in your sector. And the third we only use in a crisis situation, which is around reassure. So this might be, for example, if there's been a natural disaster or product recall or there's been some you know, changes in your organisation which might have attracted negative publicity, you're going to have to go into reassure mode. Each part of your PR and social media strategy has to align to one of these overall arching goals. It may change over time, but it's really important to step back and work out, what do I need to say? If I'm actually raising awareness, what are my key messages? Unlike a marketing plan, your key PR and social media messages are those little sound bites, those grabs which the journalists are going to be able to use. They're going to be able to retweet, they can share it, they can use it in, in perhaps some of their podcasts to describe your business. So having analogies and metaphors which help you bring that to life might also be worth thinking about as well. With reinforcing, it's about making sure that you keep giving me great examples. It's all very well to say you are the best or the most innovative of what you do, but how are you going to prove it? Can you give me a little example? Can you give me a case? study maybe with a client or an employee or a product that you've actually trialled and tested, what were the results? What difference did it make to the lives of the people that you're trying to reach through media and social media? Remember, 80% of us would rather use social media to get referrals, to use business products and services than we would, say, traditional advertising or perhaps an editorial where we feel like it's not really speaking to us. The third thing in your strategy is around if there is a crisis, how are you actually going to deal with it? What are the messages that you need to pivot into? What steps have you taken? What measures do you have in place? We'll have a little look more closely at crisis in a later episode, but it is important to have that as part of your PR strategy. Once you've had a little think about why you're actually doing your PR strategy, I encourage you to do a little bit of a SWOT analysis. This is where you actually have what we call your strengths, your weaknesses, and this is from a PR media perspective, your opportunities, and your threats. So you might have done this in your bigger picture 
business plan. From a PR perspective, some examples which I could give you for which might help bring this to life is with the strengths. Are the strengths that you're the fabulous new kid on the block? You have a tech app which is the first to market. It's going to change the lives of a massive amount of people very quickly by making things cheaper, easier, simpler to do. Say, for example, in the accounting sphere or you might be in the music sphere, whatever it might be. What are those p key PR ideas which are different? The weaknesses could be there, it could be really expensive. It could be the most expensive app on the market. Um, your market is perhaps a youth audience and they perhaps don't have the budget or the inclination to spend a lot on the technology. They'd rather use the free services out there. So you might have to address those kind of weaknesses, which over time you might be able to address and then they actually become strengths. So suddenly you get to a point where your business can offer these services or these apps for free. The opportunities might be that you are new, you're the new kid on the block. If we go back to news values, one of the things that all journalists like are first. I'm the first to do something. It's the newest, it's the most exciting thing. So if it's never happened before, the opportunity is to be the new kid on the block. And most media will really respond to that. It's often harder to get messaging out in the reinforced period of your, of your business. So in raising awareness, the launching the shiny new object or the shiny new product or service will definitely get you lots of media attention. Perhaps when you're a little bit more established, you have to find new and innovative ways to actually get those messages across. With the threats, it could be anything. It could be, for example, no budget to, for an ongoing PR campaign. You might only have a launch budget. The threat could simply be that you don't have the staff to actually monitor the media calls, to actually proactively pitch. It could also be that you have a competitor who you haven't even thought about yet, who's got a faster, better, more innovative product that comes along. So in your PR plan, you definitely have to start off with a SWOT analysis. And that will really help you work out what is it that your business has to offer. It can be really helpful to get a consultant in to do this with you. Often if you're in the business, you're very close to the business. You're not going to really identify all these strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats the way somebody from an external perspective will. So definitely take time to sit back and do this. And you might spend a few weeks working on this before you even pitch your first media idea. So following on from the SWOT analysis, you might then want to think a little bit about the actual platforms that you're going to be using. I definitely suggest that you think about things that are shareable, that are likeable, that people can comment on and engage with. And even in traditional media, if you look at online newspapers, for example, you'll actually see at the bottom there is moderated comments. So there is an opportunity for many people to share and like things which are from the traditional media platforms as well as from individuals who might be experts or influencers in their sphere as well. One thing we really like in social media is stuff that is quirky or interesting. So anything novel, anything unusual, if you're saying a similar thing to other people, you're less likely to get shared. The difference being is if you're a prominent organisation or a celebrity, that's a little bit different. But generally speaking, to stand out from the crowd, you need images, you need content which are a little bit different as well. I definitely find most of my clients who have, say for example, Instagram accounts, might post different things to what they might be on their LinkedIn pages. So Instagram is very image heavy. So what you want to make sure is that you're capturing that audience. They are just scrolling, they're flicking through. A picture does tell a thousand words. The same idea, the same blog post might actually have some fantastic ideas in it, but you can't share that on Instagram. That is something which probably live on LinkedIn where your thought leadership can be heard and the social media platforms are all distinctly different. I definitely would also separate your personal and your professional social media accounts. So in your strategy, if you are someone who has a profile, you might want to set up a business version of your particular brand or your name um, on Facebook or on any other social media platforms. That way you can have your personal holiday snaps and things with family and friends kept in a private setting, but with a public profile as it builds, you're going to need to make sure that you understand how to use that content a little bit differently as well. Definitely keep on top of the privacy settings. Um, they do change from time to time. So making sure who can see your content, who can share it. Moderate those comments. So you will get trolls on social media and part of your risk management plan when you do your PR strategy is how do you actually deal with it. Sometimes you can delete the comments, sometimes you can report them to perhaps the, you know, the gatekeepers of that social media or that media outlet. However, it is really important to have uh, I guess a moderate view on that because people are entitled to their opinion. So they've had a bad experience, for example, at your restaurant and you just shut it down. Well, that's probably not 
genuine. You'll probably find those sort of comments will just keep coming back. So you're better off addressing it, making sure that you're speaking to the individual involved as well as being mindful that more than that is likely to see it. So I know most of the journalists will actually use social media to gather information about a business and a brand before they even do some media interviews with them as well. So to be really social media savvy, it's about being on the front foot. It's about having lots of people obviously like you, to have your shareable content ready, to have followers. But followers who don't actually convert to customers are something which I'm not a big believer in personally. A lot of my clients like to monitor the return on investment. So if you're spending five to 10 hours a week on social media, but you're not seeing necessarily those likes converting through to customer relationships, to sales, to new opportunities, you need to really, really assess that. It's also about being very dynamic in the space. I would definitely suggest you pre-schedule your posts. So if you are going on holidays or you're going to be in a conference, you're going to be busy, you can actually use tools like Hootsuite to actually have your blogs or your ideas or your content uploaded at certain junctures. Research tells us that most people look at their social media first thing in the morning, lunchtime, and early to late evening. So depending on the time zones you're working in, if you're global, that those rules may not apply. But generally speaking, that's when it's good to post. Certainly don't overpost or overshare. That's one thing that brands haven't learnt the hard way. People will then unfollow you, making sure that everything that you share has been thought about. I like to use it as a litmus test. I actually show it to other colleagues or other people outside of my organisation to say, is this post making sense to you? Is this negative? Are we saying anything bad about anyone? Well, then maybe we should take it down. Because once those things are out there, yes, you could remove them. But if you've got comments and you've got people already interacting with your brand, you want to not be seen as sanitising that social media experience. Paid content and unpaid content. This is something I get asked about a lot. Because of the way in which the traditional media space has actually been disrupted, your strategy needs to have a section where you look at not only the paid content, so that's your own content on your blogs, that might be you know, ads that you might take out, interacting with your unpaid content. So that might be where you do your media interviews, that might be where you are sharing ideas, gifting people perhaps some of your IP or a little sample of your book or whatever the platforms are that you're, you're playing in. You've really got to... To continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.